Hey, Slider Crusaders. America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. What's your price? Everyone has one, right? What would it take for you to sell out your morals? Slater, how dare you even ask me? I never would. Of course you wouldn't. What would it take for someone, you think, to sell out their country? What if someone threatened to kill you? Oh, so that's pretty dramatic. Okay, all right. Let's take it back a notch. What if someone said, I can advance your career beyond your wildest imaginations? All you have to do is sell out just a little bit over you. What if someone gave you a lot of money? I have two stories I want to share in this segment where someone sold out for each of these reasons. And we need to know these stories so that we can learn from their mistakes. First story, I am mad at every single person who knew this story existed and did not share it until now because it is a perfect historical parallel to today. So let's spread the word of this story right here. April 1979, in, uh, there are people in Yekaterinburg, Russia, middle of nowhere Russia, people started getting sick, dropping dead. Some were able to make it to the hospital, but some didn't even make it to the hospital. They just died, and they were uh, categorized as uh, pneumonia. The secret police came in, seized all of the doctor's records, seized all the patient's records, and ordered the doctors to keep their mouths shut. This was 1979 Soviet Union. American spies saw what was going on, and they knew immediately this was a lab leak. But the Russian government said, oh, no, 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 no way. Contaminated meat. Ah, bummer. What a shame. Contaminated meat, huh? 66 people died. It took, this was 1979, it took until 1992 with the collapse of the Soviet Union before Boris Yeltsin finally acknowledged uh, it was a lab leak from a weapons lab down the street. This is even after a, uh, a Nobel Prize winning biologist from Harvard went to the Soviet Union to investigate, and he concluded, yes, the current Soviet account is very likely to be true. It wasn't. And everyone in the area, everyone in this town knew the truth. It came from the weapons lab down the street. It's <laughs> just like COVID. Gee, where did this COVID coronavirus come from? I don't know, maybe the coronavirus research lab down the street. Back in Russia, one woman, she went to the hospital. She was unconscious there for a week. She survived. She woke up, and gosh, golly, wouldn't you know it? Who was in the hospital room with her but some people from the KGB? And they made her sign documents saying she wouldn't talk for 25 years, which is weird why they would only make it a 25-year, right, as opposed to just the rest of your life, but she knew what they meant. She knew the truth. And she feared for her life. So that's the first reason why people don't speak the truth. In some countries, people fear for their lives. What would you do if you were that woman? You knew it came from, a, you knew it was anthrax that came from a weapons lab down the street. Your whole life, you have to say, oh, I must have had some contaminated meat. If you don't, they kill you. What do you do? There was a doctor in town. Uh, New York Times called him a foot soldier in the cover-up. He said he knew immediately that it came from the lab. <laughs> he said there's no way it can be uh, a, from food. It doesn't, right? He said we all understand, excuse me, we all understood that this was utter nonsense. But he didn't tell the truth because he wanted to advance his career. He was a doctor, he didn't want to be kicked out of the profession and him going along with the government story allowed him to proceed higher and higher up the ranks. That's why he didn't tell the truth. What would you do if you were that doctor? The local newspaper was uh, the editor ordered, well I should say the government ordered the editor to tell everybody else to not report on this story. And the editor told the employees, he who can keep a secret comes out on top. <laughs> that is like so dystopianly creepy. He who could keep a secret comes out on top. After the Soviet Union collapsed, people could talk. 
And now we know the truth. There was a lab technician who forgot to replace a safety filter. That's it. It doesn't have to be any more dramatic than that. That's all it was. And a few just milligrams of anthrax escaped. The wind blew it uh, 30 miles down the street, across town, and people breathed it in and got sick. That was it. So listen, if the parallels to this story are not obvious enough, <laughs> this is exactly the story with COVID. It's a lab leak. The communists say, oh, no, natural. For people in China know. There's people there who knew the truth and who know the truth, but they're threatened with death if they say anything. And there's a lot of people there who know the truth, but they want to make sure that their career can continue to advance. And there's also a lot of American scientists who go along with it and back the communists. It's the exact same story. It happened in 1979. It's a shame we're just hearing about it now. We didn't have this historical parallel in the beginning of it all. But I'm looking at, and, and you may be thinking the same thing I did when I heard this story, because the parallels are obvious, but I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, but that's, those are communist countries. What the heck is our excuse? <laughs> what about America? We're not an authoritarian country. I understand how the KGB can threaten your life if you speak out about something. Like I, 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 I get that. It's like, okay, right? We don't have that here. The government's not forcing people to stay silent or to say different things, right? What's our excuse for going along with this? For going along with these lies, for selling out our morals, and for selling out our country? Which leads to the third reason why people sell out the truth. Money. The Prime Minister of Pakistan demonstrates this for us beautifully. So here's the background of this clip. Are you ready for this story? All right, buckle up for this story. October 6th of last year, this is outside Paris. A dad asks his daughter, why are you not in school today? And she says, um... Uh, uh, well, my teacher, yeah, 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 my teacher was showing a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, I left the classroom because it was so offensive. Because I'm a good Muslim, Dad. And the dad got upset, started a campaign against the teacher and against the school. People freaked out, and then an 18-year-old Muslim went ahead and beheaded the teacher in broad daylight right on the street. Turns out the 13-year-old actually wasn't even in class that day. Well, the dad was right about that. She wasn't in class, but it's not because she was offended by the Prophet Muhammad being shown. It's because the day before she was suspended for bad behavior. And she made the whole thing up because she didn't want to tell her dad that she got suspended. So she made up some noble reason for why she wasn't in class, okay? Crazy story, but let's keep going. After his beheading, the president of France made some comments like, hey, everyone, this is crazy. You extremist Muslims, you got to get it together. Stop with the Islamic separatism, okay? Well, then, oh, that's so Islamophobic. So the prime minister of Pakistan sent an open letter calling on all Muslim countries to unify together and speak out against the Islamophobia in Western countries. Are you with me? So you see how this works. A Muslim kills people, and then the Western media and Muslim leaders talk about the rise of Islamophobia. It's how it happens every single time. Okay, so that's the background. That's how we got to this clip I want to play for you right here. So a reporter at Axios is talking to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, who went to school at Oxford, and he was the captain of, of, the, the, of Pakistan's cricket team. He's like a popular guy, and like a Western guy, too. So the guy at Axios, he's like, hey, Prime Minister, why did you write this letter to the Western world, or I should say to the Muslim world, about your concern for Islamophobia in the Western world. Why'd you, why'd you do that? And he goes and he gives this blowhardy word salad answer about how the Western world is so mean to Muslims and it's just not right and Muslims are people too and you guys are so mean to Muslims and Western Islamophobia is so bad. And then the reporter amazingly follows up with this. Just across your border in Western China, the Chinese government has imprisoned more than one million Uyghur Muslims in re-education camps. The Chinese government has tortured Muslims, forcibly sterilized them, 
and they've destroyed mosques in Xinjiang and also punished Muslims for fasting, praying, even giving Muslim names to their children. Prime Minister, why are you so outspoken about Islamophobia in Europe and the United States, but totally silent about the genocide of Muslims in Western China? What our conversations have been with the Chinese, this is not the case, according to them. The evidence is just overwhelming. Whatever issues we have with the Chinese, we speak to them behind closed doors. China has been a great, one of the greatest friends to us in our most difficult times. When we were really struggling, our economy was struggling, China came to our rescue. So we respect the way they, they are. And whatever issues we have, we speak behind closed doors. Ah, pretty good, right? So good. So I love that. First he says, well, China says it's not true. Then we talk behind closed doors. And then finally, the root of it, they give us a lot of money. So I'm going to sell out, or the Pakistan, Prime Minister of Pakistan says, I'm going to sell out my morals, I'm going to sell out my values because they give us a lot of money. Then he goes on this whole thing about, hey, why don't you Westerners, so he deflects. He says, why don't you Westerners pay enough attention? Why do you pay so much attention to this, the Uyghurs? And why don't you pay enough attention to the Kashmiris in India, right? There's been this dispute in this area between India and Pakistan for like 100 years on these people, whatever. So he deflects away. But watch this. So the, the reporter comes back, right? And first of all, look how uncomfortable the prime minister gets. He like starts looking away and looking, and he's like, geez, how am I going to get out of this? But he sounds like LeBron James defending China. Here. They've been a huge partner to you, China. But on some level, doesn't it make you feel sick to have to be quiet because of all this money they're putting into Pakistan? I look around the world, what's happening in Palestine, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Afghanistan. Am I going to start talking about everything? I concentrate on what is happening on my border, in my country, this is on your border. Which, is, which is part of, no, that is part of Pakistan. 100,000 Kashmiris are dying. That concerns me more because a half of Kashmir is in Pakistan. This is a grotesquely large human rights atrocity. I would... First of all, I'm not sure about that because of our, conversations, our conversations with the Chinese, this is not the picture I'm sure that comes that. from that side. So just to put a fine point on this, you are not in any way concerned about the Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang? Our discussions with Chinese will always be behind closed doors. So good. Ah, oh, so good. Not surprising at all, right? So again, just to drive it home, why does he have so much concern for Western Islamophobia? Which translates into nothing, by the way. What percentage of Americans are Muslim? Do you know? What percentage of Americans are Muslim? 1%. And it's only 5% in France, right? So there's no Islamophobia in the Western world. There's a Muslim genocide going on in China right now, right next to Pakistan. A million Muslims are in re-education camps. There's entire Muslim cities that are controlled on total lockdown by the Chinese, and it has nothing to do with COVID. But this guy's complaining about what? He doesn't care about what's going on in China because money. So that's one reason why people sell out their values and sell out their morals and sell out their country. It's what the Prime Minister of Pakistan just showed. But it's no different than LeBron. You want to find out why someone would support the commies? Ask LeBron. Ask Disney. Ask Hollywood. Ask Apple. Ask Google. Ask all these companies who have sold out us <laughs> to the communists. It's about money. So what drives people to sell out their morals and sell out the truth? There's many, but the only ones we have time for in today's show. First, many people don't want to be killed. Second, people want that career advancement. And third, people want money. If truth, and this ties into our, our segment we're going to have coming up in third segment, Vody Bakken's going to be here, which I'm stoked about. If truth is not the highest value, then very easily it will be sold out for much lesser things. True story. Mike Slater. Coming up next, we'll talk about the conscience. Spread the word.
Oh, that's very nice. How are you? How are you, Senator Cassidy? There's a little segment we call Life Lessons. This is our intro to Vody Bakum, who's coming up next, one of my favorite pastors. I can't wait for him. So we're going to keep it quick because I want to talk with him as long as we can. Um, I want to talk about your conscience. Your conscience. How sensitive is your conscience? How closely can you hear it? And do you follow it when you do? We've talked on the show a lot that there's four limits to bad behavior. Uh, God, conscience, culture, which is your family and uh, people around you, and uh, the law, police and court. So four limits on bad behavior. God, conscience, culture, and the law. And we live in a culture <laughs> that, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, progressives have systematically removed each of these from our society. They've removed God, they've removed our conscience, they've, removed our, they've destroyed our culture, and now defund the police, right? And then we wonder why bad things happen. But I want to focus on conscience in this segment. We live in a culture that tells you to never listen to your conscience, to turn it off. We live in a culture that tells people that their conscience is a social construct. And that is a lie. We need to understand what the conscience is. So again, our modern culture says feelings of guilt are bad or are hurtful. Therefore, turn them off. Turn off the feelings. Don't get to the root of why you have those feelings of guilt because nothing you do is ever wrong. Everything you do is great and perfect and wonderful all the time. So if you feel guilt for that, that's your conscience speaking, but it's your conscience that's wrong. So you just better turn that thing off. Cut it off right now because that's making you feel bad. We're told that your conscience is a defect. It's a defect inside of you that robs you of your self-esteem. And that's all wrong. I'm stealing this from John MacArthur. He says, your ability to sense your own guilt is a gift from God. So we need to, it's not that we need to do a better job of ignoring your conscience. No, the opposite. We need to do a way better job of paying attention to it, of, of hearing it in the first place, and then actually following on it. Uh, MacArthur says the conscience has an innate ability to sense right and wrong. When you violate your conscience, it condemns you, triggers feelings of shame, anguish, regret, consternation, anxiety, disgrace, even fear. These are good things. It's telling you not to do this thing that you're going to do. <laughs> and the question is, how much of what we see today, how much of the movements that we see today, the social justice movement and all that, is rooted in shame, guilt, regret, anxiety, right? People feel shame for what they do and then they try and bury it. So they double down on that thing that made them feel shame. So they become an activist to try to make it a good thing that, that, that I'm doing this thing that is causing me shame. And you do that long enough and you have successfully cut yourself off from your conscience entirely. So the word conscience is super interesting. So it's a combination of two Latin words. The first is sire, S-C-I-R-E, S-C-I-R-E. It means to know. This is where we get the word science. And it has a double meaning. It also means uh, to cut, meaning to differentiate one thing from another. And this is where we get the word scissors. And then con in Latin means together. So conscience literally means knowledge together with oneself. Knowledge together with oneself. So that means your conscience knows your inner motives and your true thoughts way deeper than your brain. <laughs> your conscience is above reason. It's above intellect. You can rationalize and justify yourself and your actions in your own mind, right? And there's a lot of research that actually the higher IQ you are, the better you are at lying to yourself and rationalizing bad behavior to yourself. So you're good at that. But it is hard to rationalize and outwit your conscience. You can't, so instead you just cut it out. But that's really hard to do. The Hebrew word for conscience is leb, which is usually translated heart. So the Hebrews did not draw any distinction between your conscience and the entire rest of your inner soul. Right? So in the Bible, when Pharaoh hardened his heart, it was his conscience that was cut off from himself. There's so many scriptures that talk about uh, a tender heart, a 
inside. So that just means you're being sensitive to your conscience. You hear it when it's whispering to you. Uh, Psalms talk about being upright in heart. All right, so upright, that means someone with a, with a pure conscience. David prayed, create in me a clean heart. So he wanted a cleansed conscience. But if you keep violating it over and over, and especially when we live in a society that encourage you, encourages you to violate your conscience, eventually it goes silent. Or it may be screaming to you at the top of its lungs, but you just don't hear it anymore. Now, this is an important point that John MacArthur says. He, he says that a conscience can be either dulled or sharpened. It can be dulled or sharpened over time. So in order to sharpen it, you just need to refine it with God's word and better align it with God's truth. And he says that the conscience, it's a skylight. It's not a light bulb. It's not a light bulb inside of you that has its own source, necessarily. It's a skylight. And the effectiveness of a conscience is determined by the amount of pure light that you expose it to and how clean you keep it. Cover it up or put it in total darkness, and it ceases to function. I'll give you another metaphor. A conscience is like the nerve endings in your fingertips. It's sensitivity to whatever it's touching can be damaged by a buildup of calluses or even wounded so badly it, it, you don't feel anything. And that's why Paul wrote about a calloused conscience. He literally, 1 Corinthians, talked about a calloused conscience, a wounded conscience, a seared conscience. And we lie to ourselves, and then it's even worse when you have adults and every, you know, your school and every cultural force around you is training you to ignore your conscience. We need to be raising kids to deeply understand our conscience, to listen to it, to purify it daily. We keep doing these, you know, we, instead we just keep doing these bad things over and over again, and we, we wonder why. Well, it's because you keep, you're not, you're not listening to your conscience. <laughs> so, Let's try to gear into that again, right? Let's try to tune into that. Let's listen to your conscience again. Maybe it's been wounded for too long. Listen to it and then follow it. Coming up next, Vody Bauckham, one of my favorite pastors. He's got a new book on critical race theory. And this all ties into it. Uh, we'll get to the root, the real spiritual root of critical race theory. Well, I should say the critical race theorist. And then how do we fight it? spiritually, which is the way that it needs to be fought. Talk with him next. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, now that we've seen uh, we, we conservatives and many people have been stepping up and saying, hey, there's all this critical race theory in our schools and this is a terrible thing. A lot of people, have, teachers have stepped up and said, no, what, critical race theory? There's, there's no critical race theory here. What are you talking about? And here's a teacher on his TikTok. So critical race theory talks about how the systems that we have, the laws that we have, um, how all of those are designed to oppress people groups. Things like mass incarceration, the prison industrial system, the military industrial system, all of those are used to oppress people groups. By teaching this in the classroom, we can show our kids what systems need to be challenged and thought about differently. Racism isn't going to be fixed by me going down to a kid right here and saying, hey buddy, you really need to be nicer to that kid over there even though they look a little bit different than you. We can dismantle racism by dismantling systems of oppression not by being nice to people. It is a great head of hair, though. I'm not going to deny that. One of my favorite people, Vody Bakum, is here, and he's got a new book. It's called Fault Lines. I always take book covers off, so uh, this is not useful, me holding it up. But there it is, Fault Lines, the social justice movement and evangelicalism's looming catastrophe. Mr. Bakum, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, thanks. How about yourself? Uh, really good. It's wonderful to talk to you. Um, I'm convinced that critical race theory is a spiritual battle, and we need a spiritual mindset and spiritual solutions to it. So that's why I'm so grateful that you're on the front line, sir. Um, let's start from the jump, I guess. What's the difference between a critical race or a critical theory worldview 
and a Christian worldview? Well, um, critical theory, and that is the way to look at this, because critical race theory comes out of critical legal studies, but all of it goes back to uh, critical theory writ large, which comes to us from the Frankfurt School. And the critical theory worldview says that the world is divided really into oppressors and those whom they oppress. Um, it, it views the world through that lens and says that what we need to do is, you know, problematize, uh, criticize, as the term critical, these things so that we can work toward a revolutionary political answer, a revolutionary political overthrow of these um, structures that oppress. Now, from a biblical perspective, uh, the Bible is clear that there is sin, that there is oppression, but this sin and oppression doesn't come from an ethnic group. It comes from the evil one. It is a spiritual reality, not a political reality. And man's problem is internal and not external. You don't fix man by fixing or opposing political structures. So the answer, so, but it's so obvious. So if, if you get rid of, so if we live in this modern world where there's, where I'm great, I'm perfect, self-esteem, all the rest, then there is no sin. So the cause of my problems must be external. Is that people's thought process? Yeah, it really is uh, because we don't believe in sin anymore. We don't believe that men are sinners. We believe that man is basically good. You know, we have this sort of Rousseauian idea of, of who man is. And then we look at structures and we say that structures and systems are the problem. And particularly in this day and age, the structures and systems are things like the West and capitalism and particularly America and also Christianity. And this is what a lot of Christians don't get. You know, they get involved with all of this, you know, critical social justice and so on and so forth. They don't realize that when you scratch beneath the surface, that one of the oppressive hegemonic powers, according to criti critical social justice, is the church, is Christianity. So Christianity has to be problematized, and also uh, overthrown, if you will, and moved from its position of authority and of power so that Christianity stops oppressing people. Amazing. Why do you think critical race theory has been embraced by so many in the church? How have so many people been tricked or, I don't, I don't, I don't even want to put a statement on it like that, but how, how has it gotten in the church yeah. so prevalent? Because it doesn't expose the whole lie, right? Just like any good lie, um, there, there's, there's some element of truth. So as Christians, we know that there is injustice and we're about justice. We know that there is racism and we're about reconciliation and unity, right? We know that these things exist. We know that there is oppression and we're about deliverance from oppression. And so when critical race theory, when critical theory, these, these, these other critical pedagogy, um, when these things use these terms, when the critical social justice movement uses these terms, and when it talks about justice, right, and social justice, um, it, it sounds good to Christians. But then I'll go a step further. You know, the overwhelming majority of Christians in this country have been educated by the government. And they've been educated in schools that have been pushing critical pedagogy for generations now. And so, you know, we, we already lean in this direction, and it doesn't take much to push us over the edge. Uh, I want to ask you about justice. My family, we were listening to one of your sermons last night, uh, cooking dinner, as we often do, uh, and you were talking about this idea a little bit and, and how they've co-opted this concept of justice, and there's climate justice, right? Everything is, they put justice in front of it to, uh, I guess, make our eyes glaze over or be in support of it, just default. Um, what is the biblical view of justice that we need to be advocating for instead? Yeah, you need to understand that when you hear justice from the critical social justice perspective, or when you hear social justice, we're talking about redistributive justice. The idea there is that there is a lack of equity, that there are disparities between groups of people. And so social justice is about eliminating disparities between groups of people. And so if climate change creates disparities, 
then we have to deal with climate change, not to save the planet, but, but in order to reverse those disparities. Um, and if we see disparities, then we see injustice. Whereas from a biblical perspective, justice is about the righteousness of God and about the law of God being applied equally to all. Biblical justice sees all of us as guilty before a holy God and sees Christ and his atoning work as our only hope because he's the one who satisfies the justice of God. I'm, try, I'm trying to take that, what you just said, from the perspective of someone who, from a social justice person. And they would say, yeah, yeah, that's great, Vody, But that doesn't solve my poverty. That doesn't solve the injustice. Let's just stay with climate. The injustice that I live on a poor part of town next to an oil rig that has caused my kid to have asthma or something. That doesn't solve anything here in the now, Vody. So we need real redistribution so that my uh, life can be improved. Yeah, well, who's going to do the redistribution, right? That's the question. And the other issue is this, that as believers, as followers of Christ, we are the hands and feet of our Savior. And so when we see a situation where somebody is in poverty or somebody is, you know, being oppressed or mistreated or whatever, we don't then turn and say, okay, system, fix that. We actually get involved in that circumstance. We actually get involved with that issue. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, my wife and I have been involved in the pro-life movement, you know, for a long time. And eventually our involvement in the pro-life movement, you know, because of the injustice of murdering children in the womb, um, led us to the Ministry of Adoption. And so we adopted seven children in nine years because we weren't just about saying, you know, oh yeah, uh, system, do something. As Christians, um, when we saw a need, we got involved. And I think that's one of the problems with the social justice movement is that it now takes the onus away from the individual, number one, from looking into our own hearts and dealing with our own sin. But number two, for taking care of our fellow man and instead, we look to the system and say, system, you do it. Hmm. A system which is corrupt and or inept and exactly. not spiritually minded. Um, what are the sins that you think are most prevalent today? <laughs> and, 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 and this goes both sides. This is, this is, these are the people who are against critical race theory, like myself. Like what sins am I dealing with in this topic? And then the people who are you know, for it. What, what sins are at the root of this? Yeah, pride, um, you know, pride, greed, selfishness, um, you know, uh, you, I mean, you, I could go on, but really pride and greed and selfishness lay at the heart of, of much of this, and it always has, because that's who we are. We're prideful and we're greedy and we're selfish and, um, you know, we want what we want and we want it now. Um, we see other people as being guilty and needing to be dealt with. And we see ourselves as having good intentions so that even if we do something wrong, we need to be just based on our intent. Um, yeah, it, it, we're, we're, sinful, we're sinful creatures. And we're always happy to embrace an ideology that allows us to look to some other cause rather than our own sin. Mm. Uh, I want to ask you about your life in Zambia and the difference between the worldviews and just cultures uh, in Zambia and America, and really also how that caused you to look at this situation here in America of critical theory through a different lens. Yeah, it's interesting. We've been there. It'll be six years in August that we've lived there, me and my wife and our seven youngest children. Um, and one of the things that happens when you move away from the United States is you have a greater appreciation for what it means to be an American, a greater appreciation for uh, the distinctives that make America what it is, and really a greater appreciation for the way that the gospel and Protestant Christianity have allowed us to have the kind of culture that we have. And, 
it's interesting. You look at the world and you say, okay, where are the freest people in the world? Where are the most prosperous people in the world? Um, where are the least corrupt, corrupt places in the world? And they are those places where the Protestant Reformation has run the deepest. Um, where are the places in the world that made moral arguments against slavery when everywhere in the world had slaves? Um, you know, there are places where the Protestant Reformation had run most deeply. And, you know, I think having an opportunity to live outside, uh, not only of the United States, but outside of the West, outside of the developed world in a developing country, has really made me grateful for those things. But it's also made me see how spoiled we are and how ungrateful we are for the things that we have and how decadent we've about- become. Totally. I only got one minute. Um, unfortunately, what is uh, so? I think we're riding the coattails of that, uh, as you mentioned, Protestant Reformation, and and we've lost track of obviously everything we have. Um, what are one of those cultural norms that we've sort of just been swimming in and we take for granted? We don't even realize that maybe they don't have in a country like Zambia and a culture like Zambia. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there are a number of things, not least of which is our form of government and our form of representation that we have. Um, and the idea that, you know, we have this sort of, you know, overturning of government here that a lot of people don't see. In the whole continent of Africa, I think there's only been three times where an incumbent has lost an election. Um, that says a lot about the way that, you know, countries view themselves a way that power is held on to um, and it's very different than what we see and experience in our culture uh everyone must buy the book this is the one that you need to buy in order to understand all of it and obviously the spiritual dimension of it which a lot of books about critical race theory obviously don't get to uh fault lines the social justice movement and evangelicalism's looming catastrophe uh Vody bakum mr bakum grateful for you sir thank you so much it's my pleasure thanks for having me Fault lines. Go buy the book. Coming up, Bethany Mandel, one of our favorites, wrote an amazing article about the family and just how we live in a culture today that denigrates being a parent, even from parents. It's weird. <laughs> Talk to Bethany next. True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders. Our next guest wrote a fantastic article called Modern, Modern Motherhood Has a Major PR Problem. And in the article, she talks about uh, this valedictorian you saw. This is a couple weeks ago in, in Texas. I have dreams and hopes and ambitions. Every girl graduating today does. And we have spent our entire lives working towards our future. And without our input and without our consent, our control over that future has been stripped away from us. I am terrified that if my contraceptives fail, I am terrified that if I am raped, then my hopes and aspirations and dreams and efforts for my future will no longer matter. I love how we just like blow by the premarital sex part. Like we're like so far away from <laughs> where we need to be. The premarital sex isn't even on the table. Uh, Bethany Mandel is here. Bethany, how are you today? Good. How are you? Great to talk to you. Um, I've 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 been calling this celebrating ugliness, and I see a lot of parents where they they talk about and they celebrate uh, how their life is just a disaster, and they talk about yeah. how great and funny it is and all that stuff. Right? Um, where do you see it happening? I mean, I, I see it on social media. I, a couple of years ago, um, on my personal Facebook account, exited every single mommy Facebook uh, group and unfollowed almost every single page because it was just dripping with negativity and um, and sort of disdain for for the idea of motherhood and the institution of motherhood and also for children themselves. And, um, and it, it's, it, I mean, it was, it made a big difference for my own mental health mm. um, after I sort of took that out of my, my orbit, my personal orbit. 100%. There's almost two different things here. You have like that valedictorian who doesn't have kids yet. And then you have the people who do have kids and, and still complain about being parents. Maybe let's talk about the valedictorian first. Where did this concept come that once you have kids, your life is over? So I think that 
I think that it comes from the the other group. I, they they sort of they meld into each other, and so when when people without children and without friends who have children see what motherhood is like and how it is depicted by people who do have children and they see nothing but negativity and nothing but disdain for, again, the institution, for children themselves, this is where they get the impression. They get it from parents themselves. And and I think that it's it's sort of a punchline in the media, but it, it's, it's largely social media driven. Maybe we need to be more sensitive to even what you're, you're seeing. Uh, like what, what kind of things are people doing that they may not even realize how negative they're being um, yes. so that we can be more aware of it? I mean, we, we saw it a ton, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, parents complaining constantly about being home with their children and just how hard it was and how miserable it was. And for me personally, I, I, I mean, first of all, like with all full disclosure, our lives really didn't change that much. We already homeschooled. I was already home with my kids. I work part to full time. This juggle was not new to me. That being said, everyone complained constantly about how annoying their children were and how hard this was. And and basically just they, they wanted to offload their children again back to the care situations that they had had established previously. And I totally appreciate that this was a really challenging situation for a lot of parents trying to work from home with their kids afoot. But the way that they talked about their children as though they were burdens and they were annoyances and they were making their lives miserable during this um, was extremely toxic. Wow, you're so right. And what's the, what is it, isn't Jordan Peterson one of his original rules was something yeah. like, uh, don't let your kids do things that make you hate them <laughs> or something yeah. like that. And I feel like for a long time, we've been letting our kids get away with things that we hate about them. But yep. because they're doing it at school or away from me, it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah, I the f the first time I've ever read anything about parenting that I felt a connection to was that rule of Jordan Peterson. So I was like, this should be a whole parenting book, Jordan Peterson. Write an entire yeah. parenting book. And the re I, I hate to sound kind of snobby, but I'm going to say it. If you have raised people who you hate, that is a reflection on how you've raised them. They're not completely blank slates, but you're not you're not you're not blameless in this situation. If your kids are bratty, if they are entitled, if they are destructive, that's a reflection on their parenting. 100%. Uh, so what do we do? What, what have you committed yourself to doing other than uh, stopping the negative inputs? What, can, what else can we do? So I stop the negative inputs and I also stop the negative outputs. I try very hard First of all, to treat my children as though they're human beings and to not talk about them in a way that they might feel attacked if they were to see it themselves. If I'm if I'm typing something or, or on the phone with a friend and I'm talking about my kids, I want them to be able to hear everything that I'm saying and not feel like they are not loved or that they are being attacked in any way. And I think that those sort of small steps of respect for our own children then reflect back on us. If we respect our children, they in turn reflect that that respect back on us. Mm. I see so much in, in, I'm in one now mommy Facebook group, like a large family's Facebook group because people have car suggestions all the time and I'm car shopping. But one of <laughs> the, um, one of the, the constant sort of refrains from people is my child is such a brat and I hate them so much and they're so disrespectful. And I always comment and I'm kind of a troll about it. I'm like, wow, it sounds like your kid has sort of a respect problem. I wonder where they learned that from. I'm reading this about them in a Facebook group of 15,000 strangers that you're putting them on blast. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps they've picked up on this disrespect <laughs> in the home. Just like, Amazing. just throwing it out there. <laughs> uh, Bethany, I want more wisdom. I lost track of time. We got to run. Uh, everyone go read the article. It's called a modern motherhood has a major PR problem. Bethany, always wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for the inspiration. True story. Mike Slater. Do it again tomorrow. Spread the word.